All right, folks, thank you for joining us for this session on everyone's favorite topic. So we'll try to keep Sorry. it a little bit interesting if we can, since I'm sure that everyone in tech policy has been hearing generative <laughs> AI nonstop. What I have, what I will say is I've been surprised by how many conversations I've been in, even with tech policy people on generative AI, where they have yet to actually try the products, which is very interesting to me. Um, Adam, you were there too. <laughs> and uh, so I think that there's a mix between on one hand, kind of like semantic satiation on hearing chat GPT or generative AI. And yet on the other hand, it is still so new and so unexplored by the vast majority of people that we have a lot of responsibility, I think, as active tech policy and AI policy people to do what we can to convey the experience, to replicate it, to get people involved and to explain the issues that are happening. So we will start um, with a brief two minute rundown the panel where we'll introduce ourselves and give our give our weirdest favorite anecdote about chat GPT that we think is somehow revealing about the state of technology and its societal implications. So it's going to be fun. All right, I'll start off. I'm Austin Carson. I'm the founder and president of Seed AI, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that we started last year for the purpose of helping to build um, AI powered innovation ecosystems for communities and congressional districts around the country. And we also do a lot of work and have a big focus on bringing in AI experts and on educating Congress, the administration and anybody else who is willing to listen. So my brief anecdote is that one of my best friends, his father is a Korean immigrant Pentecostal preacher, which I have to imagine is a interesting I don't know if it's small, but at least very niche demographic. And he's 70 years old and he's been using ChatGPT to take his sermons in like not fully proficient English and then re-summarize them in proficient English. And it's especially useful for children because they don't like, you know, when he's teaching the kids sermons, it's harder when it's, I guess, broken and unformed English. So he's been doing that. Another friend of his, who's also a pastor, has been using it to actually write in Korean. His, his, it's the same thing. It's also in the United States. So you, you have both sides of this of like, you know, you're communicating with people, refining your native language, communicating, and then adapting a second language. So with that, Adam. Uh, I'm Adam Thier. I'm a senior research fellow at the R Street Institute uh, here in Washington, where I cover the public policy implications of emerging technologies. Proud to say that I believe I've been to all 19 State of the Net conferences. Tim Lorden sent me a chairman sticker. I'm not yeah. the chairman of anything, <laughs> but uh, I get a special ribbon. So uh, that's good. Uh, gee, a chat GPT story. I don't know about a chat GPT story, but I'll tell you how AI has really changed my, uh, my kid's life and I in a big way. Um, I do a lot of online gaming and stuff with my kids. My son and I, our favorite video game of all time is a Japanese language video game only. And we do real-time translation using AI tools, both of the menus and of the communication. Yeah, what game? Oh, I'm really, this is terrible. All I'm right. a 50-year-old man. Right, we'll talk, we'll talk later. Earth Defense Force uh -huh. is the name of it. It's basically a bug killer yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, and my son and I is 18 now. Uh, we've been playing this since he was like eight. Um, but now it's Japanese only. And through AI tools, I just put a little stand on, in between us and we can read what the menus say, hear what's said. That's awesome. Hi, I'm Renee Duresta, Technical Research Manager at Stanford Internet Observatory, and uh, we study abuse of current information technologies. So about two and a half years ago now, um, I got access to GPT-3, uh, their academic research partnership, and um, I decided I was going to write about it, and I was going to have it co-author an essay in The Atlantic with me. And I asked it to write the closing paragraph, because this is always the hardest part, and anybody who writes, you always figure out how to tie it all together. So I trained it on some of my prior stuff, just so kind of fine-tuned on, on my writing. Um, and, uh, it really, it started returning the most remarkable things like the end of the, it would write a short paragraph and then it would include like, you might like, and then the names of other stories that it yeah. thought were like adjacent to what I was writing about. But the most remarkable thing it returned, I did this a number of different times, um, to kind of test the outputs was it fabricated a research scientist at MIT, fabricated him, gave, you know, names of papers he'd written where he worked, this, you know, incredible AI scholar who had really been at the forefront of such and such a thing. And I could not find this man on Google. And of course, you know, I understand how the technology works. I had, to, you know, seen it generate a series of other things that are just indicative of probabilistic responses. But the fact that it really convincingly bullshitted an entire person and gave him citations and papers, I actually emailed a friend at MIT and I was like, can you go through your directory and see if like, I just can't find this guy because it said he was active in the 1960s. 
So for me, even like the remarkable um, authoritativeness of the outputs, uh, even as somebody who understood what was happening, was uh, was what kind of stuck with me most, uh, even a couple of years back. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Kalin. Um, I'm a fellow at the Internet Law and Policy Foundry uh, and also author of uh, Machine See, Machine Do. A lot of my own work really focuses on sort of the um, bias and uh, technological bias and ethical issues of how AI um, is implemented in the criminal legal system. Um, and so a lot of what I work with is sort of predictive policing, criminal risk assessments, um, and sort of how it gets it right and how more often than not it gets it wrong um, in those sort of contexts. Um, as far as weird stories involving ChatGPT and generative AI in general, um, because I'm so focused on a lot of the um, sort of like the policing and surveillance aspects of AI, um, I was really surprised to see just how much discourse and debate is in uh, the academic space. Um, a lot of uh, school districts, principals, teachers, and sort of worrying about, oh, like, will my students suddenly start using ChatGPT to generate whole research papers and essays? Um, and on the flip side, also seeing people say, oh, look, I create this whole paper about this particular really complicated topic, and then seeing fake professors, fake papers, and fake sources being cited, and people who might not be experts in that field thinking, oh, this is legitimate. Um, and, you know, having experts kind of come and check them. Um, and I think that's been really interesting to see um, sort of beyond just the space that I work in. Well, thank you. I'm Renee Cummings and a professor of practice, data science at UVA, a criminologist and an AI ethicist. I think for me, it has been the a number of uh, academics and, of course, high school principals who have reached out to me to ask me, how do we incorporate this into what we're doing? And uh, what is encouraging is that most of them are not interested in banning it. They're interested in using it, but finding responsible and ethical ways for the students to use it. I think the other thing would be the uh, number of companies who've also reached out to me because a substantive uh, part of my work is uh, crisis management and risk management, who want to do this uh, within the realm of sort of reimagining their business model but wondering what are those risks? What are those pitfalls? What are the, the crises from contractual to reputational to, to, to media risks that they can face? So uh, I think the good thing about it is this desire to innovate and to continue to use it to innovate um, and uh, as well as uh, just not uh, generating an extraordinary amount of fear around the technology. So that definitely is very promising. Yeah, and it ties in really well um, to a next question. And we've got some polling that I want to read that I found kind of incredible over a month period. And then with a tracking poll from when we started the organization last October. So October 2022, when we CDI kicked off, we did a poll on American sentiment around AI and optimism and pessimism and things that would allay fears, et cetera. We found as my kind of random tracking thing that only 3% of Americans had heard of GPT-3, right? So however many months ago that is, you know, it's not, not terribly, terribly. So let's look at February 1st, YouGov, less than half of Americans had heard at least something about GPT, chat GPT, right? February 17th, asked respondents if they were very or somewhat interested in a number of products. 43% said they were very or somewhat interested in tools for police or criminal justice. A use of AI with considerably higher stakes, right? That was strange. February 22nd, Despite these new AI search products not being available to the public, public yet, survey of more than 10,000 shows that half 52% say it is a technology that is here today, or it is here to stay, and that today we have people, like in that two-week period of time, the number of folks that had used ChatGPT jumped from 6% to 10%, right? So you're seeing like a week-over-week -week increase of like 4 to 6% of actual users at this juncture, right? And so when we think about that, that rapid change, now, what do you think that, especially as the API is opened up March 1st, right, and folks are going to be able to far cheaper, cheaply and easily monetize the technology, like, you know, what does that ultimately mean for our daily lives and for the fact that if this is here to stay, like, what's our responsibility? And then what do we need to make sure that we consider for folks that aren't always paying attention? Matt. Sure. Um, well, there's going to be an explosion of interest, obviously, because these technologies are moving so fast. Uh, if we would have been talking about this even just six months ago, um, not a lot of people, as you just pointed out with the polling data, would have even been talking about ChatGPT or knowing what it is. And now it's on everybody's lips. 
and it's even become part of like the uh, the the social content media holy wars are turning into the AI fairness holy wars, right? And you already see like people on the right and the left already looking at this saying it's unfair, it's deceptive, it's problematic. You know, people trying to rig these systems now. Look at the anti-conservative bias. Look at the the the, the whatever bias and. You know, so I think this is going to just absolutely explode. And I recently did a, a, a study with Neil Chilson um, at Stand Together where we actually tracked like state level activity and interest in algorithmic fairness writ large and just tried to get a handle on just the explosion of legislative and regulatory proposals. And it's already become overwhelming um, in just a very, very short period of time. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 only going to get more so with each passing one. Maybe we can turn to, maybe we can turn to Renee here real quick. Um, you know, I think you put a focus in our prep conversation on how do we innovate but do so responsibly. And I think, you know, uh, Davrina and A.B. have both made the point that if it's a race, but, you know, we're doing it so irresponsibly, nobody wins. And we certainly don't. Right. So from your perspective, how can we still kind of address this? It's here to stay. People are interested, a little nervous while being responsible. Well, I think there's when we say AI, there's so many different buckets that fall into that. So if we're speaking about Generative text. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. If, we're, if we're talking about generative text, then there's a um, there's a creativity component. People want access. They want to produce material. I think the focus, and this is maybe um, an unpopular opinion, I think the focus on trying to negate its outputs is um, is not focusing on the, the the bigger picture. I think mm -hmm. the bigger picture is how does it transform economically? How does it transform society economically in a few short years? How does it impact people's livelihoods? How does it um, how are artists compensated for their work when their materials are used to train the system that replaces them? How do we think about the impact for creators? Uh, while at the same time recognizing that it is a profoundly powerful tool, I use it to get through kind of low-level stuff, write a summary of this talk, give me a paragraph about this. You know, it, it is incredibly effective. Um, it's going to have broad, broad appeal. I think perhaps rather than focusing on gating out, there are some interesting opportunities to think about the market opportunities created by new spaces that actually prioritize either um, proof of person where you know that you're engaging with real people if it's in a social space or uh, content where there is a, um, you know, a strong um, authenticated human component to it. You know, you can envision the sort of uh, anti-GMO type model of <laughs> authenticated human content or artisanal models. There is, I think, opportunities to see shifts in demand as the tools are democratized and, and outputs change. Mm -hmm. Well, let's briefly talk about the you know, NIST AI risk management framework, because I think this goes into some of the, you know, as it's evolving, how do we think about it? What are the verticals, et cetera? And one of the comments as it pertains to generative artificial intelligence that I've always found the most disturbing is, is you're going through the AI RMF, right? As you're saying, if we're not thinking about generative large models or foundation models, then it's a different experience. You know, you put it in that, con that context, you do your research, you run it in vivo, whatever. And it's a lot less uh, randomly non-deterministic, right? Now, at the NIST AI risk management framework, when they were talking about testing and validation, they mentioned, you know, they got to the point of large models and people were like, I don't know, we couldn't even, we'll never, there's no way we'll ever be able to really validate those or say that nothing bad's going to happen because it's insane. And, they, you know, one person kind of paused and they're like, well, we could, but it would just cost so much. It takes so much time. It would be pointless. And then everybody kind of, all right, well, I guess. And it was like a crazy moment for me. Like, I mean, that's, you raise a good point that it isn't feasible, but that is like a, all right, I guess, good luck, you know. I'll, I'll address very quickly. We tried to put, so we um, at SIO did some work with OpenAI and Georgetown CSET asking the questions, how does this transform influence operations specifically, which is sort of the most manipulative, um, you know, active propagandistic measures to deceive the public. Um, and what does this do for that? So very particular, um, very particular space. And there are efforts towards detection of content. There are efforts towards gating of content. But we tried to think about where the impacts were and where the harms were. And public resilience, making people aware that this content is going to proliferate, that you are not necessarily going to know if what you're seeing was created by a person. You're not going to have a strong sense of provenance. Um, perhaps the way that that work was done in the context of video deep fakes, making people aware this is a new technology, this is emerging, this is what it can do. Um, be cognizant that not every video you see on the internet is necessarily real at this point. I think there is that social adaptation piece of it that that comes into play. I wish that there was more in the way of mm -hmm. guardrails in this paper. We try to articulate a variety of approaches, uh, but I do think that ultimately public education and 
and uh, population resilience becomes a, a kind of a, a key focus area. And so would you say, and I want to turn over, Renee, I feel like you've also been ready to say something, but so would you say, and open to anybody, that for something where we can't have some degree of assurance, you know, or that falls within that risk management framework from an educational perspective, that it's almost like a box where it's like, we don't actually know what this is going to do at any given time. 97% of the time, it'll do something fine, but 3%, who knows, you know, I mean, how are we going to move forward and what, how should we think about that education? Well, I think uh, the challenge is that we are using these tools and these tools are being tested on us. And, and, and that's the, the most unique challenge of it. And while we do desire to approach any sort of technology in ways which are responsible, of course, accountable and, and, and uh, transparent, uh, the challenge that we're seeing uh, with these uh, large models is that beyond the fact that they're introducing an extraordinary amount of new risks. So if you decide to incorporate this into your business model, it really uh, puts you in a position where you have to rethink contract law, copyright, intellectual property, subcontracting. There's just so many other things that you've got to think about. But I think our challenge now would be the AI hallucinations. It would be the uh, fact that what we are, we are seeing there are things that uh, are falsehoods, that are uh, believable falsehoods. And uh, as Renee said, um, it comes back to that level of literacy. AI literacy, media literacy, data literacy, and whether or not we are really upskilling ourselves um, in real time to deal with these challenges. And of course, the challenges that we're seeing would be uh, really the amplification uh, of bias and, and discrimination and other systemic challenges, and whether or not we have the opportunity to pull these things back, we don't. But I think there's an extraordinary amount of hype at the moment. And I think uh, within the next few weeks, we will see something else being introduced. But the main thing is that we've got to continuously uh, show that we are not only ready, but we are really ethically resilient and uh, to deal with these challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, and I want to tack on to Renee Alpha One, two. You know, um, I want to tack on to that story. Why, you know, I was red teaming one of the models some months ago and I you know, went in whatever direction of self-harm to check that. And it gave me a wrong suicide hotline number. Right. And to your point, I was searching for uh, programs that I didn't think existed. And it came up with an extremely promising one. It was like heartbreak. It was like waking up from a happy dream. I'm like, damn, I thought they already done the exact thing I was trying to do. Um, so, yeah. But you said dangerous. something very interesting there, a wrong suicide hotline number. I mean, when you think of that within the context of, of mental health and you think of that within the context of a teenager who may be at that moment looking for help, that's something that's absolutely devastating to know that there is a wrong number there. And those are things that we can't take lightly uh -huh. because for, for you, it may have been a wrong number and something that, you know, just you laughed off. But for someone who's really in a very, very low place, that's a matter between life and death. Exactly. And I completely agree. It is. It is very much. And it's one of those things where they're not, a lot of people won't search the other one, you know? Um, I, so, you know, looking at the speed of adoption, right? Looking at the fact that on one hand, it is like kind of a social zeitgeist bubble, right? Just inevitably because of its raw speed. I will also say that regardless of that fact, its raw speed is both very impressive and very terrifying if part of your premise is that we need like social and public education to keep up with this. And I would also argue that like social and public education for the, you know, last decade, two decades of uh, technology epoch didn't really pan out super well, which is part of why I'm like deep fakes, but we didn't need deep fakes. So I don't, you know, um, but what I will say is, I mean, how much do you think that we have to address this from like aggressively pursue it as a technology issue to address in the short term as we build up educational capacity? And what does that encouragement look like? You know, one of the things that we really focus on as an organization, you'll hear about later, is the National AI Research Resource as a great place to do some of this, you know, common, like social come together work of a safer place, depending on how you want to look at it, with the capacity to address some of these large scale issues, as well as all of the other like unsexy, how do we implement AI to help reduce shoreline, you know, shoreline uh, decay. You know, look, the, the NIST framework actually is really good on a lot of this because, first of all, 
I love the way it's version like software, right? These risk management frameworks, they need to be iterative, adaptive, agile, flexible, and it's version 1.0, right? And we're, we're going to need more versions of that with more learning, more literacy, more resiliency based solutions built in. Uh, it's a constant ongoing societal and individual learning process, a lot of learning by doing in real time. Now that's, that's a challenge. I think I agree with everything that's been said about like that. This is the, the, the difficult part of digital literacy has always been like, how do you get people off that learning curve? But now the learning curves are just like waves that are coming faster and faster, crashing and crashing. I see my friend Stephen Balkum here in the front. We've been on numerous online child safety blue ribbon commissions and testifying or been on them formally. And we're constantly recommending digital literacy, media literacy, digital citizenship, these sorts of things. Uh, but there's no doubt about it. We have to admit it's getting harder, right? And that, that real-time learning process is the fundamental challenge. I'd like to think the NIST framework gets us a lot further towards getting industry and other stakeholders to actually do a lot more of that and be a lot more socially responsible about educating their community and their base. But the problem is you have both the supply side and the demand side problem. The supply side problem is the pacing problem, the pace of technological innovation constantly moving ahead of policy and culture. And then the demand side, sometimes known as the Colin Ridge dilemma, is basically the fact that once the public sees something and wants this new shiny object, it's like everybody wants to have it. And it's like demand, 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 right? And so that those are the that's the two-sided problem because every new AI app, I, I agree, there's gonna be something next next week that'll come online. People are like, well, I want that shiny new thing now, and the next one, and the next one. That that's a learning process at the speed of light. <laughs> and in the old days when we talked about like video games and media literacy, well, there were only two thousand video games released in the old days per year. We could handle that problem, right? It's a different order of magnitude, a scale that we're dealing with, with uh, artificial intelligence, especially generative AI. Yeah, and uh, if I can jump into just speaking to digital literacy and sort of how uh, we get, you know, that supply demand conversation going. Um, I do think that, you know, whenever we're talking about new innovations um, in that race, right, that for forever race between innovation and, and ethics and, and morality, I find innovation always ends up winning out. Um, and whenever there's a new technology that's being introduced, I think especially with things like generative AI, we need to also teach people to be a little skeptical, a little critical about, you know, not getting lost in the enthusiasm and excitement about this new technology. Um, and returning back to your, or, you know, what you were saying about the API being more widely accessible and sort of that proliferation of uh, chat GPT. I also think about stable diffusion and it's used by Lenza. All of a sudden, our social media threads are inundated with, oh, look at this magic avatar that's been created. Um, this, you know, robot has created this really cool looking, you know, anime or uh, watercolor painting version of these photos I've uploaded. But we don't think about, well, how long do they get to retain those photos for? Um, are your photos being used to train future iterations of that technology? Also, where's, is it really painting this for you? Is it really, you know, creating this artwork for you? Or has it taken artwork that was, taken non-consensually by artists who have not agreed to give that to you. Um, and you're using that to essentially cobble together something. And now you're posting everywhere. There's no credit being given to the artist. Um, and I think it's important to be critical about those inputs, right? What's being used to train the AI and before we start celebrating all the outputs and all the really fancy, shiny things that it gets to do. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And looking at intellectual property, I mean, as we all know, everybody here on the panel and in the crowd. Intellectual property baits do tend to get into everything else at some level because it is the game of kings, you know? Um, and I do have a sense that many of these issues will be either resolved or escalated through lawsuits, such as the Getty Images lawsuit that we're seeing right now, or through kind of the, you know, the rumblings of intellectual property lobbying that causes the counter lobbying and then it swirls up into content moderation or, you know, patent reform or copyright reform, a very similar thing. So in your perspective, first of all, is there a constructive path forward? Are there any methods or concepts or work that you've seen that's very promising in beginning to address that problem? And then in general, when it looks like information provenance or the humanness, proof of human, as you were saying, Renee, like, you know, what's the other side of that DRM puzzle? Because I presume that both of them will be some form of digital rights management or, you know, something like that. The blockchain. Are we having crypto conferences here today? The blockchain. <laughs> well, well, definitely digital rights are most critical. And of course, a digital justice is also very critical because the other challenges with these uh, large language models would be questions around democracy and, and decision making. And again, uh, disinformation 
And uh, combining that with the deep fakes, you know, we're creating a, a landmine there of, of, of questions around uh, justice and fairness and, and equity. Uh, I think it's really promising because we're seeing more and more uh, conversations and more and more scholars addressing uh, the topics. We're also seeing conversations that are coming out from the uh, global south and uh, more uh, multicultural conversations are happening around uh, the uh, model itself. So I think we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, a, a movement and, and a lot of traction. I think uh, what we need to see more of would be the, the governance and the regulation. But then how do you govern something in real time? That's the challenge, because by the time you're ready to legislate, this is uh, turned in and morphed in uh, to something, something else. So uh, those are going to be some of the very unique challenges playing catch up all the time with uh, innovation and uh, with technology. But I think uh, as an educator and uh, as, uh, as, as a parent, as well as uh, someone who is uh, using the tool, uh, for me, I, I believe that it is innovative, but it is not that creative because it really is rote learning AI style as opposed to really meaningful learning, which uh, really includes more diverse intelligences. And it's just not there yet. You know, uh, I, I love that, you know, how do we govern in real time question? I think that's exactly right. And looking back, uh, I mentioned I've been at all these old State of the Net conferences. I remember I'm a veteran of the old, like, uh, Grokster Napster Wars and then the uh, Viacom YouTube Wars. And, you know, there were lawsuits, man. There were huge lawsuits. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were also new business models and there were new governments, uh, governance structures that developed out of that. And we live in a world today of, you know, real-time streaming of all your music and, you know, mo business models evolved, governance systems evolved. A lot of the way it evolved, and I would argue in a very bipartisan way, is through sort of multi-stakeholder negotiations and a lot of ongoing collaboration with different stakeholders. Uh, I've done some really dreadfully boring law review articles on the rise of soft law governance for emerging technologies and talk about how the, the, the Bush years, the Obama years, the Trump years, they didn't have a lot in common, but they did have in common a reliance upon this sort of like soft law bottom up collaborative multi-stakeholder process of bringing people in a room and trying to hammer out some rough rules of the road for governance in real time. And I'd like to see for a lot of AI, especially generative AI, uh, you know, NIST and NTIA and others get together and constantly in real time bring people in a room and say, we've got to hammer out some rules of the road like right now. They don't have to be formal. We can debate whether they, they will be a formal law or regulation. But I think that's so hard. I mean, we're still like 13 years running on trying to get a baseline privacy bill through. Can't get that done. Six years running on trying to get a driverless car bill through. Can't get that done. And there's a lot of agreement. We all need that, right? But we never get that done. So you've got to have a backup plan for governance in real time for AI. And I think that's where we can do a world of good. And there's been a lot of really good blue ribbon commissions, best practices reports. There's professional associations, IEEE, ISO, ACM, uh, BSI internationally, others that are doing this in real time. And we've got to start somewhere. That's got to be part of the answer. And a, a big, big part of that will be the digital literacy educational component. Uh, but a lot of also will be like a corporate so social responsibility or what increasingly is called in Europe, uh, RRI, responsible research innovation uh, efforts. And I think that's ultimately lead in the short term. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I, I like RRI, that's good. You know? Yeah, I, I think some of them want it to be more of a precautionary principle regulatory approach. That's a different question. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, they're going to get it. Yeah. Right. This is the tension between the U.S. model and the, and the European model. Right. Mm -hmm. They will get formal rules. Here, I'm not so sure. I think a lot of people are clamoring for them, left, right, and in between. But again, I mean, where's that baseline privacy bill? We can't even get that done. So I'm, I'm just very skeptical. We get like an algorithmic accountability act. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that happens. Well, uh, and I don't think we have the capability to do so either. I mean, this is kind of what I was alluding to from that one testing evaluation panel. We don't, and even to having nimble governance, right? And a, and a rapid iterative process and product. I mean, I, a, the different new models are breaking through benchmarks so rapidly that we have to remake benchmarks for mo like AI about every three months at this juncture at latest, right? And so I think you have to have so much goodwill and good faith in a group to adapt that rapidly to that. And again, with the opening of the API, and personally, I find much more concerning rapid dissemination of open source products that have no protections whatsoever, the ability to do distributed training of models, right? Yeah. But on the flip side, you had the interesting question of you were able to tune your model with all of your writing so that it could write like you, you know? The questions that um, that I've been thinking about is 
the it's creation is only one piece, particularly if you're thinking about as as you know, my work really focuses very much on manipulation. So that's the um, you know, not to sound overly pessimistic, but it's mm-hmm. what I work on. Um there's the creation piece, but then there's still the dissemination piece, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's interesting is that people don't trust random no-name accounts created yesterday that begin to talk to them on the internet. So there is a natural kind of, um, you know, kind of a human defense mechanism to some of the, you know, some of the ways that you would have to engage in order to put that kind of content out. Similarly, um, it is hard to create a persona out of nothing at this point. That is one of the ways in which we observe the creation of front media by state actors is these people don't exist. They don't backstop them well enough. It's very hard for them to do that. Interestingly, AI will make that more possible and easier (laughs) as we go. Mm. Um, But right now it's not quite there. And so there are these interesting ways in which you can um, create, you don't want to create a a wholesale skepticism, right? You don't want to make people constantly distrustful that everyone around them is trying to manipulate them, but you can using education, articulate ways in which um, check to see what the source is or who is speaking with you. Or the Again, it kind of ties in a little bit to basic media literacy. So while the content becomes cheaper to create, while the content becomes more persuasive, while it sounds more like um, you or, or a legitimate person, there are ways to think about that dissemination piece. I think spear phishing emails are actually one of the areas that mm. people are very, very concerned about the intersection with cybersecurity um, where you can train a model or um, create content that you, where you study your target, see who your target talks to, and then create content that appears to be uh, produced by that person. And so there are ways in which the manipulation potential significantly increases. But again, uh, basic cybersecurity practices don't click on a link in your email unless you know the person and have verified the email address. Maybe these sorts of things become more of a focus of educational efforts. And so do you think that we, you know, it's kind of a function of that, you know, progression that we're in this eternal cat and mouse game to some extent, right? Like there's, it, do you think there's going to be any time in the near future, some kind of solution that allows us again to watermark or to print or to somehow be able to assert the, you know, human creation of something or the non-machine creation without it just being, again, there's a tool that's released. We can detect 94% of content. The next iteration, retraining of the model, they're like, whoops, we can connect 30% of it, right? It's been, I mean, even in the um, GANs generated faces or um, deep faked video, that arms race has been happening for several years now. Um, you know, I, I think that there's that component to it. When, when I was looking to new business models and rather than trying to keep bad stuff out, can you create environments that, um, you know, are engineered around real identity? I think that becomes an interesting question again. Uh, I think that we're not necessarily quite there on how that would be implemented. There are some people who are going to feel that um, that it excludes people who don't want to engage in that way. I, I think it does provide an interesting new opportunity where you might see some of those communities be created, even around something like persistent pseudonymity in the style like you have on Reddit, where there's kind of like a cred that goes along with you. And, and that sort of persistence maybe becomes the model. I think, um, again, we, we try to articulate in the, in the paper various ways in which it could theoretically be implemented, but no one, of course, has actually done this yet. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the content um, coalitions, again, like the DRM coalitions that were stood up I don't know, a couple of years ago and then all consolidated into the single one CCP2A or something? I mean, do you think that that should have a direct flow into some usefulness in this environment? And then a second question is one of the researchers that we work with as part of the Wilson Center AI Pipeline program, she is explicitly focused on how, you know, being able to track individual, like, parts of the training data that disproportionately impact the output for the purpose of being able to see the relative value of it in the operation. I mean, do you think maybe something like that? Do you think the inverse thoughts, feelings, are we just hoping that we run into something good? Well, sure. Documentation is critical mm-hmm. uh, to uh, uh, ensure that, you know, accountability and transparency and, of course, explainability are always there at the top of the agenda. But I think uh, one of the things that you uh, spoke about, which you alluded to, was the, the, cat and, the cat and mouse game. 
but it is really a cat and mouse game. It's almost like the hamster on the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. Because we just keep going and going and going and going. Uh, the challenge is that these models are going to be more and more. Uh, we've got to do it responsibly. We've got to do it ethically. We've got to build the kind of trust uh, that's required. And we've got to ensure that people are critical thinkers and that our, our students who are using uh, these technologies understand it cannot replace critical thinking. You still have to find other sources. You cannot take the information at face value. You still have to do more research. One of the things I like about it is that it's going to make the classroom definitely more engaging because when you present these papers, now professors and teachers and, and, and other, other persons in the classroom are going to ask you more. So there's going to be more conversation around your paper. Uh, we may just go back to the old days of show and tell. <laughs> where you've got to actually come and do something to say, this is actually my work. So um, as uh, Adam says, you know, we're seeing these, we have an opportunity to create new business models as we have an op opportunity to create uh, new learning models as well. So I think, you know, uh, much conversation around generative AI and uh, like all AI, its long-term impacts are critical. We've got to pay attention to bias and discrimination. We've got to see who has voice, even though, you know, we're typing and it's, you know, it's, it's about voice. It's about visibility. It's about access. It's about opportunity. It's about how many people don't have access to the Internet and may not be able to access these tools when we think about the digital divide and we think about all the things we need to work on. So this just gives us much more to work on. Mm -hmm. and to get right in real time. I love your hunger for hard work. I respect it. <laughs> I respect it. Normally, I think of us all as masochists, but I like that you really dive into it enthusiastically. Um, so we are at South by Southwest uh, this upcoming Saturday, God save me, um, are doing a kind of calling it prompt detective, but it's an exercise we're doing with Houston Community College. They're going to bust in because we did one of our AI across America. That was me, Renee. I just hit my mic. Um, we, we did one of our A Across America programs with Houston Community College. Uh, some folks at Hackers on the Hill were talking about generative red teaming. And so we've worked out this deal where it's like, here's the categories of you know, failure or danger in these models. You know, you've got hallucinations. You've got, um, I don't know, all the stuff. And so I think we've got 20 questions in there for like relative categories. Working with GPT-NEO, right? So we've got some of the open source filterlessness danger in there. And then coming at the end of this couple hour thing and doing like, all right, one team build a filter that you think will not be able to de be defeated by the prompt of the other team. Now that you've learned all the failure modes. And so, you know, looking at, and this is just all in a desperate attempt to figure out how can we bring people into this and let them know how it functions in a way that then leads to curiosity and interest in that. I mean, so, you know, from y'all's perspective, do you think that both this education, like, the governance has to be that Adam recommends, I don't know about you guys, comes from the ground up? Or do you think that we have the opportunity to like wholesale create programs before that stage, right? Like, do you have a clear enough idea of what that critical thinking educational change would look like in general? Or do you think that we have like piloting work to do kind of in all of these areas? Well, well, we mentioned several times here the idea of red teaming. I'm not sure mm -hmm. everybody knows what that is, but, the, you know, the idea of sort of like a lot of trial and error and figuring out in real time, hopefully preemptively, like what are the bugs in this, you know, in the code and this algorithm. Uh, I think we need to try to figure out how to scale that up mm -hmm. and find institutional structures and best practices to make that more of the norm. And that's part of that corporate so social responsibility kind of mindset or RRI mindset um, of baking in best practices by design. We've heard, you know, the term used for the years, you know, you know, privacy by design, security by design, safety by design. The, these can mean things, right? But they need to have some buy-in from a diverse group of players. And there needs to be institutional structures. And I think the good news is today, there's a thousand flowers blooming mm -hmm. in terms of like different frameworks, best practices, you know, ethical guidelines. The bad news is there's a thousand flowers mm -hmm. blooming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at some point, the, all the flowers can become weeds that take over the garden. And you're like, what's, how do we get some consensus here? Mm -hmm. And in the old days, uh, I mentioned when Stephen and I, you know, are cutting our teeth on like video game regular policy and like to have, trying to fend off regulation and censorship. We got buy-in around a single entity and a single like rating system. And, but that was like a more of a static kind of concept, a set of content, much easier thing to deal with. We thought it was quite challenging at the time. 
Um, but it really wasn't nearly as challenging as what we face today. So how do we do mm -hmm. real-time governance, real red teaming, uh, and figure out how to do that? Best practices by design, baking and ethics by design, and you know, keeping humans in the loop. These are the two things that you see all the governance frameworks glom around, like best practices baked in by design, humans in the loop. You hear this again and again and again in all the different frameworks. But there's just so many of them and everybody's got a slightly different plan. So this is the great challenge. I've already said, I've already given away what I think needs to be done. I think you have basically a standing committee with NIST and like NTIA working together to have real time, uh, rough and ready rules of the road and best practices being just like constantly made on the fly. It's just a constant iterative learning process in government. There's no end to that. There's no final end state. It's endless. And that needs to be encouraged and you have to get around politics to get this done. The problem is the people on the far right, the far left are gonna say, it's rigged against us. We already see this today. I mean, the, 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 there was this recent Washington Post story and New York Times story, both did about like all the conservatives saying, it's woke AI, you know, it's being programmed against us. And then people on the left saying, no, it's very, you know, it's very biased, discrimination, discriminatory and disinformation, right? Something's gotta give there. There's gotta be some light in between. There's got to be some effort to come together and say, let's try to get some best practices through and trust each other on this. This is why I don't think we'll get formal legislation, but I do believe there are still smart people in government and in industry and other shared stakeholders who can come together and find consensus best practices to try to have a more socially responsible, algorithmic, innovative ecosystem. That's, that's going to be my hope. Maybe I'm a fool. I'm going to go with that. No, you're not. A <laughs> And uh, just to second a lot of that, too, I think to achieve a lot of that consensus, too, I think there's such a great importance for that public involvement, right? I think with the, the red team, right, involving um, the, the community college there, I think that's a really great step in, you know, just addressing some of the issues that Renee brought up with how we are sort of the, the, the guinea pigs in this experiment. And I think having very deliberate and intentional red teaming efforts um, led by the public and not just by industry folks or um, you know, public institutions, I think having um, the public come in and, you know, trial, uh, uh, trial and error, um, a lot of this, I think that's the way to not only open up the black box, but also allow for people to actually see um, what the issues are and address it. And then you're involving people in this very intentional way. Um, because I think more and more um, generative AI, but I think AI more broadly, I think developers, companies, they're almost becoming like these private policymakers. I think these are institutions with a lot of power that are um, that have a lot of influence over people. Um, and I think the people, the public should be able to have some say um, and, and be able to see how that process is run, um, you know, in conference rooms and um, computer labs, things like that. Yeah, I think that makes, I think that makes a lot of sense. And we heard earlier about uh, impact assessments and audits, you know, and there's going to be a debate about that. I think all roads lead to some sort of format of algorithmic transparency is like people's preferred solution. The question is what that means. How is it made more concrete? I, I think there's going to be a lot of really important work done over the next, you know, couple of years about thinking through what transparency through an auditing regime kind of looks like. And even if there isn't a formal sort of part to that with an algorithmic accountability act or the privacy bill provisions, I think you could still get a lot of buy-in from people that there should be at least a private process. There are already, and we heard from one of them earlier today, companies that are out there doing this in real time. And this builds on a well time tested model we've had in other contexts from underwriters laboratory to various other types of certification regimes. The professional associations I mentioned from IEEE to ISO to ASM, they all have wonderful frameworks for these things. And then the NIST product brought it all together, right? And I think the only problem with what I've described there is that it's so iterative that it's kind of messy. It lacks precision. People want certainty and they want silver bullets. Mm. They want to like, well, we got to solve this and we got to solve it now, right? And there is no now. There is no moment where like, this is done. It's just a constant ongoing challenge. It involves education and everything else and best practices. And that, and that is legitimately frustrating. So, I mean, I think what we've really pulled out of your statement, and I think maybe all of ours, right, is that this is a society problem, right? I mean, we certainly have a technology issue that we're trying to address, but perhaps this is the most... Uh, another clean mirror in addition to social media and Werner Herzog's lo and behold, you know, to really see that it's a massive amalgamation of humanity that assumes an archetype based upon prompt, 
You're getting right? deep now, man. You know, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I think that that is re- like, but like realistically, that's yeah. where I hear you. And it's like, it's like three o'clock, right? Yeah. Far. But I mean, I think that really is kind of what we're saying and it boils down to, but we have to break that into chunks, right? Like that's our responsibility right. here is to take that truth, which is why based AI and conservative and liberal, right. it's because there's a deep knowledge somewhere in you that there may be this version of humanity is not your version of reality and humanity, but it's going to run everything, right? Now, I would argue that perhaps the only way we can really address this and get that kind of buy-in and get that kind of ongoing iterative testing and risk management is through having a place for it, right? Is through having explicit places for it, which is one of the reasons I am such a big fan of the National AI Research Resource as an option. Um, and some of the provisions put in about test beds by one of our beautiful staff in here. Uh, and I think that, you know, I can't think of another option besides that type of public, public, private infrastructure that is designed for that social purpose, such as they are with AI institutes and NSF funded research, right? Where that's possible. Let me know if I'm wrong, but I would just be interested to know, do you think a, that we just inevitably have to have something like that to be the place where we're able to test those things? Or B, do you think that there's another option for the type of kind of common goal, common good? What well, there's we definitely a place to start, but is it enough? Mm-hmm. And, and that's the question. Is it enough oversight? Mm-hmm. Uh, is it enough transparency? Is it enough knowledge in the space to deal with the challenges that we're seeing? And is, are we taking this thing uh, seriously enough? So it's, it's a good place uh, to house it. But if we're doing these things in real time, is it really enough? You know, um, Patrick spoke about that public interest technology approach, which is so critical for stakeholder engagement and for really bringing uh, those uh, voices into the conversation. Whether or not we'll ever get those voices fully involved in the conversation is the challenge. But as I said, it's a great place to start. But the question is, is it enough? You know, think of the controversy we saw last year with the DHS Disinformation Board, right? And think of like the, the recent reports we've heard on the Hill with like uh, what some conservatives are trying to do with the, this new committee on looking into some of these issues. I mean, things get very political really quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, they already are, right? And this is why I started out by saying the social media content moderation holy wars are becoming the AI <laughs> fairness and transparency holy wars, right? And the, the sides are just so distrustful, right? I just keep going back to this very mushy, pragmatic, like we've got to find a middle way. We've got, to, and you may be right. Maybe it is, uh, maybe it is that. Maybe it's NTIA and NIST. Maybe it's all of the above. I, I don't know. And then there's an international component mm-hmm. to this, right? How are we negotiating this among the coalition of the willing of people willing to work with us on this globally? Because of course, Europeans have a different model. The Chinese have a different model, right? And they're not very, you know, very consistent. And then there's ours. Um, there's been some work done by, uh, the, uh, the bioethicists, uh, Wendell Wallach and Gary Martian of ASU law school on the need for GCC's governance coordinating committees globally, sort of like grand congresses of like an issue, a technological issue to come together and meet regularly to talk about these things. And I'm like, are you talking about the UN? Like, no, and it's not the UN because we know that model hasn't worked so well uh, for these things, but it's a good place to talk about things. And like, well, that's what this is. We need more of that sort of international collaboration and just dialogue happening. I like, I agree with that, but we got to start smaller than that. What we're talking about here is just trying to figure this out domestically, right? And figuring out pragmatic, practical, rough rules of the road in real time, real time governance, right? Um, that's That's all I got, man. <laughs> right. we're we're a very we start optimistic somewhere. panel yeah very optimistic panel um all right so since i just made that joke i'm gonna skip to our last question because i think we're also almost over time which is if we get this right right if all of these insane and practical problems about the way the technology is changing and society is changing we just figure out what does this look like in five years right like what's your ideal view of what success in generative ai policy or development looks like Anybody? You got to have a good dream if we're going to get there, man. This is way too depressing for us to get there without a good dream. I think it's going to continue to look like us. Mm. And, and that's who we are. We are not perfect. We are imperfect. We're still trying to figure ourselves out and figure each other out and figure society out. So it's going to continuously look like us. And that is why 
we need those ethical guardrails. That's why we need the real-time governance. That's why we've got to pay attention to questions of diversity and equity and inclusion and look at questions such as bias and, and discrimination. And, and that's why we've got to ensure that these technologies don't undermine what it is to be us mm. and what it is to be human and what it is to understand that we always need to just find ways in which we need to engage ethically with technology. I, I think we'll still be asking a lot of the same questions. I just think that as things improve, new things will break, new things will get fixed. And I think, you know, I think what we've all talked about is this is an eternally iterative process. Um, and I think, um, you know, as things get more complex, I think um, I, I find myself always concerned about the the biases involved when AI is you know, when AI is being developed, but also the way that AI is being deployed, the way that it's being applied to the general public. Right. And so even as we fix a lot of the more technical issues with generative AI and, and, and AI more more broadly, we also have to look about look look at how AI is being used in classrooms, in policy, in policing, whatever it might be. Um, and I think those issues will continue to exist. I think we'll just be having a little bit different conversations about the complexity of all. But I, I think a lot of those conversations will persist. I think on the uh, education front, which is where I do believe a lot of the effort needs to be focused, where I hope we get in five years is some sort of funding for that and someone actually responsible for it. Because that's the piece that always breaks down. When we talk about a need for education, a need for, um, you know, in the content moderation wars, a need for counter speech, a need for, you know, th these things, um, we all acknowledge the need, but there's very little effort towards enablement. And that's where I hope that this time around, maybe. Um, there is actually some more cohesive uh, effort spent towards creating funding for that new future. Mm -hmm. Let me leave you with a positive story. Hopefully, foreshadows where we could be in just a couple of years. Uh, last year, as part of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce AI Commission, which I'm a commissioner on, and Mike Richards was here earlier today talking about it. We're about to issue the final report on Thursday. We visited the uh, the Cleveland Clinic. And we met with doctors and nurses and scientists about how they were using machine learning and AI in real time to do some amazing things um, to basically help in real time diagnose various types of ailments and figure out how to do early stroke detection, heart attack detection, uh, organ transplant issues, uh, mental de deteriorative illnesses, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. All these things were being addressed in real time with really interesting but early human machine interactions. And the head of the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Tom Mihalovich, who had been in medicine since the early 80s, said that when he started in the field of medicine, started practicing medicine in the, in the 80s, the overall corpus of medical knowledge, overall volume of medical knowledge was doubling about every seven years. Today, he says it's doubling every 77 days. And the only way to take full advantage of all of that medical information is with the power of machine learning. And my hope is that in another couple of years, if we can get this right, this is changing public health in real time, among many other things. We could talk about this in the context of transportation and all sorts of other fields, but in public health, this is how we potentially cure cancer, address debilitative diseases, and a whole bunch of other things, right? But we've got to get all these things, other things right and build public trust uh, first. Nice. All right, I'll go a little crazier on mine to close this out. I mean, in my, in my view, I do hope that this is, you know, this is the kind of end of a barbaric age if we get this right, right? A time where you, each person has a random coin flip of dying because of a weird, you know, reaction to a medicine they didn't know about, right? Or there's a, you know, there's a horrible cruelty because we don't understand each other, right? That's just getting worse and worse. My dream is that somehow their knowledge, the, the insights to some extent, right? Like philosophical insights, I think, even we get from the aggregated knowledge will in some way slip us out. And to your point, cure cancer, have your digital twin of yourself that's tuned to you, you know, as perfectly as possible with Tim Berners-Lee controlling your data in the pod so nobody's stealing it from you. And just acting as this avatar, empowering every person ultimately to have similar power as an elite, right? And so that it is truly the essence of humanity that drives your creation, your creativity, your knowledge, as opposed to gatekeeping skills behind socioeconomic classes, right? Or your ability to buy a suit. You know? And anyways, I think that's it. I probably burned all of our time. Joe, did I burn all our time? All right, well, if somebody wants to ask a question. Question. All right. The enthusiast. Thank you. Uh, I think this great technology with great 
potentially use, but it also Chick-fil-A and Schuess by the general public has a green possibility of spreading a bird official. And by what I'm concerned about is the more folks large language models like Chad G to develop whatever. Those models search the internet for the facts that then they then and select, synthesize, and use to put out answers. The more people generate content with AI and put it on the internet, the more it's going to be like a Xerox and the Xerox or the Xerox with increasing disinformation. So is that a concern you share? And let me throw out this may be a dumb idea, but it's the only one I've thought of so far. How about a truth and content edge where anyone can use these models for anything? But it could be just a best practice, not even a law. There has to be a way affixed to the content saying generated by AI, mm -hmm. and the models can't use that content in generating their answers mm -hmm. to continue the concentration of false conclusions and false fix that get amplified in the process. Thank you. Yeah, all right, I'll do speed responses and pass it down. So I'll say, first of all, I think your last point goes to what we were saying about needing some type of system to either watermark these things en masse or to um, you know, do the inverse, right? I would say to your other point, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that we can I don't think that we can ignore uh, natural ignorance, you know? I think that that is, like, a real thing that we have not begun to address as a society, to be honest. And I think it's only risen. So I suspect that addressing natural ignorance will also have a cascading effect on artificial. And then uh, I would say, yeah, I got that. You guys take the rest of it. I'm going to pass to Renee. She's done a lot more work. One thing challenges right now is actually the idea of... Um, what constitutes a good and reputable source, right? And and so that that is in fact part of the morass we find ourselves in with regard to what should systems be trained on. While well, the Washington Post got the lab leak theory wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so that that battle is 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 kind of percolating, but will continue to um, to to come as people talk about what systems are trained on and um, and and how they're tuned. And I will say one of our board members, Jack Clark, who's co-founder of a company called Anthropic, which is a bunch of people that broke off of OpenAI, who makes ChatGPT, to start another research organization. It's definitely a concern. He's, he's raised. I mean, you he's keep ingesting good. crazy weird stuff that's a little weird. and Got a really good red teaming approach and model mm -hmm. that they're working on. To, yeah, it's just... mm -hmm. Josh New. This <laughs> Week from my team about how Jack and Chat should team the sitting clean to dramatically improve what we are today. When peer reviewed, so they know I know where it's here, but I'm pubs, reduces time and increases like task out for quality. That's to be expected for you too. But it's a plan connect him with lower ability workers as a classified down where actually. Make benefit and more than these technologies. So it's sort of flag blow the skill with it. It's like a huge win for the economic sector coverage on major wood was at a depth of that. And typically, when we pro technology, we often let like balance those concerns. But this balance, of course, you all get that balance ring. But I'm not hearing any conversation talking about well, how do we deploy this in a way that will help, like, that, you know, we can we can build a road just like a building darkness. How do you think we should be doing that? Should we be doing that when the risks are so great at this point? Um, I can balance those prices. Well, thank you for that question. I think uh, companies are still trying to figure that out. I also think that the, uh, the companies that are making the technology are also still trying to figure out how that is supposed to work. I think in an ideal space, we would be having those conversations already in uh, DC, but because it is, it is so new, that they're not uh, just there yet because there are also a lot of contractual issues because mm -hmm. just a perfect example, if you've been contracted by a company to do a particular task and you've used chat GPT, now is that a co-contractual arrangement between you? Is that a sub, you have you subcontracted uh, the technology? So there are so many 
uh, contractual challenges are still with the full implementation of this technology into the work of a company that I think it is just still very new. So yes, in the short term, it's doing that for productivity. But in the long term, we haven't realized what it has done to productivity just yet. I agree with that. By the way, there's a new book out uh, called Working with AI by Davenport Miller, two MIT profs that has, I think, something like 39 case studies of real-time collaboration happening, human-machine collaboration, and how workers are sort of like learning new skills on the job. Again, learning by doing. Wonderful book. Really, really good piece. And then I've got a paper out tomorrow called yeah. what, what Do We Know About the Future of AI and Jobs? It surveys all the academic literature on this and points out, like, we've been here before historically, and we, we just can't plan for everything. We used to an entire profession of people called human calculators that did all the math by hand and, you know, or at a chalkboard, right? And then mainframes came along and disintermediated them. But what happened to those people? They went behind the machines and created the personal computing revolution, right? We freed up time by automating and they did more important things with their minds, right? And that was considered success. But if we would have been trying to plan for that, it would have been very, very hard. Like, do we keep all the calculators at a chalkboard doing the hard math by hand? Wouldn't have been very efficient, right? It's, it's very hard to plan for an uncertain future. Yeah, I'll say that I think part of it, too, is that chat GPT and like the playground on open AI, et cetera, are kind of tools and tech demos, right? And I mean, toys and tech demos, they're just kind of a general, I mean, I think open AI in their own words were surprised that it blew up as much as it did when they put it in a chat format. You know, we are about to see again with the opening of the API, we are about to see what a massive influx of potential applications that will have disparate workforce impacts in a productized way, what that means. But the point, we're going to find that out in like a month, you know, so let's check back then. All right. Um, I think we have a time, but thank you so much for your attention. Hopefully it was interesting. And thanks especially to my panelists.